Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. As we wrap up our Iowa History Month programs, please remember that Iowa History 101 webinar series continues on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, as we close out our Iowa History Month programming, we will focus on both the old capital in Iowa City and the not so quite old capital, excuse me, the not so old state capital in Des Moines, both of which echo with stories from Iowa's past. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speakers. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are now available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speakers at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of our questions. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers in the order they will present. Liz Crooks and Joni Arnett. Liz Crooks is the director of the University of Iowa Pentecost Museums. Liz holds an MA in Museum Studies and a graduate certificate in Book Arts. She serves on numerous campus advisory committees, including the Museum Studies Certificate Program. Her interests include nonprofit administration, museology, and interdisciplinary graduate education. And Joan, or Joni Arnett, was born and raised in Des Moines. She has worked at the Capitol as a tour guide for 45 years, where she trains and manages the tour guides and has led tours of the Capitol for millions of visitors, including children, families, and adults. And now I'm happy to turn over to Liz to begin the webinar. Thank you, Jennifer. It's an absolute de delight to be here today. Uh, I took a peek at the participant list and I see a lot of familiar names. So even though I can't see your faces, hello to everyone today from Iowa City. Before we dive into the presentation, just a, a little refresher on state history because our old Capitol building was not the first territorial capital of the state. In fact, that territorial seat was not even in the state of Iowa. The United States government opened the Iowa Territory for settlement by non-Native peoples in 1833 and was overseen by a governing structure seated in, of all places, Detroit, Michigan. Shortly thereafter, oversight of the Iowa Territory was transferred to the Wisconsin Territory in 1836. At that time, Major Jerry Smith, a member of the Wisconsin Territorial Legislature representing Des Moines County, Iowa, offered to build a suitable building for the legislature to meet if they agreed to move the territorial capital to Burlington, Iowa. Thus, Territorial Governor Robert Lucas selected Burlington as the first capital of the Iowa Territory in the legislature convened there in 1838. Let's go to the next slide. The first territorial legislature decided to move the capital further west. A commission sent out to select a location in Johnson County in May of 1839 consisted of Chauncey Swan, John Ronalds, and Robert Ralston. They chose the permanent site for the capital, indicating the place by a slab driven into the ground about where the old stone capital at Iowa City now stands. At that time, the only building in sight was a half finished log cabin. But in typical Iowa City fashion, things moved quickly. By the end of July, the town was already laid out and a map had been drawn. People were beginning to buy lots in August. Log cabins and frame houses alike seemed to spring up overnight and plans for the capital moved rapidly ahead. Well, work began on the stone capital in 1840. You'll see the cornerstone here. It did not conclude quickly. And the, the legislature was anxious to move to Iowa City. 
Thus, an act was passed in 1841, officially moving the seat of government if a building was furnished without cost to the territory. A two-story frame building was quickly provided in Iowa City. The legislature used the structure for about one year before moving to the yet unfinished stone capital. Architect John Ragu is credited with designing the territorial capital building. However, he quit the project after five months, claiming his design was not followed and taking the architectural plans with him. This slowed construction considerably. It also pushed the project over budget. The original cost for the building was estimated, was budgeted to be $100,000. The finished building ran in at $350,000. And this was after the east and west porticos had been eliminated and the ground floor spiral staircase had also been cut from the project. In this picture dated 1853, you'll notice that there is no east portico um, and the front of the building as we know it today, uh, it seems very naked by comparison. The territorial legislature continued to meet in the Stone Capitol and this structure remained for more remained the capital for more than a decade after Iowa became a state. From 1846 to 1857, Iowa City remained the seat of the government in Iowa. You'll notice also in this picture dated from 1853 that there's a fence around the perimeter. That is to keep the livestock, which grazed freely in Iowa City at the time, off the property in an attempt to keep the legislature's boots clean. I'm not sure that that worked though. We can take a moment to appreciate the architectural style of the building known as mature Greek revival. It is known as mature because it has major entrances on the long sides of the building and columns at the entrances only. The building is symmetrical in form. The halls run through the center of the building and all room openings balance each other on either side of the center exterior. The exterior columns are made of white pine and painted uh, with a sanded paint to give the appearance of stone. This was a common treatment in the mid 19th century. The exterior of the building is Devonian limestone, which has floated down the Iowa River from quarries north of Iowa City. And in 1857, as the population moved west, so did Iowa's capital. Let's go to the next slide, please. That was an era of change for the building. While it was given to the university by the Iowa legislature in 1847, it was not occupied by the university until 1857 after the site of the capital was moved to Des Moines. The seat of the capital was moved to Des Moines, pardon me. The building was the university's first home. And in the early 1860s, the East Portico was added. The picture on the right, you'll notice uh, there's also been some improved fencing. There's now a road. And if you look closely, you can see uh, wagons traveling up and down what we now know as Clinton Street. So if you're familiar with Iowa City, this would have been taken from the, the corner of Washington and Clinton Streets, looking uh, northwest at the building. At that time, the old Capitol housed almost the entire university and continued to do so until 1863. It served in many ways. It hosted classrooms, faculty and administrative offices, a chapel, a library, an armory, and more. By 1902, all of the departments of the university, except for the College of Law and administrative offices, had moved out of the building. The College of Law moved out in 1910. The administrative offices, however, remained until the 1970s restoration. Next slide, please. The first major renovation to the building happened in 1920. Between 1920 and 1924, there was a major structural renovation. The oak supporting beams were replaced with steel beams. The west portico was constructed. A spiral case to the ground floor was installed 
and the southwest corner of the building's foundation, which had been crumbling, was repaired. A concrete firewall under the cupola was installed to protect against fires from lightning strikes. Remember that feature, we'll come back to it in just a bit. So on the slide on the far left, you'll see the timber scaffolding as work began. Our center slide shows the entrance from the, shows the, the facade from the west before the portico and entrance was built. And then you'll see finally um, on the right, what the building looked like when that west portico was added. Also the 650 pound crystal and brass chandelier that graces the Senate chamber was installed and more than 6,400 three inch square pieces of gold leaf were applied to gild the old Capitol stone. The old Capitol as we now know it was at last complete. Next slide, please. The State University, in, as, as the university was more commonly known at the time, undertook a, another major restoration in the 1970s. Funding for the 1.6 million restoration came from four primary sources. Much like today, gifts from individuals, businesses, and industry throughout the state helped support the renovations. A state appropriation provided for a new roof and structural repairs beneath it. Federal grants from the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the National Park System were, were given. And two grants from the Iowa American Revolution Bicentennial Commission were received. With these contributions and the dedicated work of Professor Mar Margaret Keyes, restorations took place and the museum as we now know it is open. It was at this time also that Keith sought historic designation for the building. The old Capitol is individually listed in the National Register of Historic Places since 1972. It was named a National Historic Landmark in 1976. And in 1978, it was included as a cont contributing property to the Pentecrest in itself now a historic district. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at some of those renovated spaces. Here we see a sampling of the rooms on the first floor. The top left-hand corner shows the treasurer's office. A special note here is the safe. It's, it's in the far corner. It's fireproof and it weighs 3,000 pounds. It was called a salamander safe because at that time, salamanders were thought to have fireproof skin. Below that, we see the library, which coincidentally is my favorite room in both of our Capitol buildings. Originally meant solely for the use of legislators, a 25 cent per day fine was charged for overdue books. That's the equivalent of $8.50 today. To avoid that fine, most legislators chose to use the books on site. Each book is marked on page 30 with the notation, Iowa State Library. A fun fact about this library space, the State Historical Center, the State Historical Society was founded in this room. Next to that in the center bottom is the Supreme Court Chamber. It served as the United States District Court for the region. The high bench and close tables meant the judges could not see the prosecutor nor defendant. This was to reinforce the idea that justice is blind. You'll see benches were provided so that spectators could, preserve, could observe the proceedings. Not only was that a popular pastime, women were also allowed to observe, unlike the house chamber activities. And lastly, we see the governor's office. The maps on the walls were frequently updated to represent the ever-growing state and country. The double-sided desk allows for two individuals working at the same time. You'll also note uh, in these spaces, the abundance of spittoons, something that was of great importance in the day. Next slide, next slide please. 
And now we have what may be uh, my favorite feature of the building, the reverse spiral staircase. It is literally and figuratively the centerpiece of the building. Only one of three in North America, it is unique in that the top step aligns directly over the bottom step. Walter Seekert, who designed the details of the staircase during the 1920s rehabilitation, said that no two balusters supporting the handrail are of the same length. It took them quite some time without original architect's plans to uh, reinstall the staircase. It must have been quite a feat. The four columns surrounding the staircase are the only original architectural pieces remaining. There are stories uh, abound about the staircase. One of the most famous is when the law school occupied the second floor of the building. Law students would race down the stairs at the conclusion of their classes, causing it to shake and sway. If you look closely, you can see a steel rod in, in the background. Um, that was installed, but it's mostly for show. I think it gave them a great sense of security. The next slide, please. If you've ever attended an event at the old Capitol, you're most likely familiar with this room, the Senate chamber. While it is the Senate chamber, this is the second room in the old Capitol restored to represent university use. This is not how it would have appeared at the time the Senate met there. Everything in this room is as it was in the 1920s with two exceptions, an elevator, which was installed and covered to look like a closet and the paneled wood shutters, which though removed in the 1920s rehabilitation were reinstalled to assure uniformity in appearance when the room must be darkened for uh, specific events. It is now used primarily as an event space, hosting lectures, symposia, recitals, and of course, weddings. The Steinway piano, Rose, because she's made of rose wood, was moved in through a window during the restoration following the 2001 fire. Also of interest, the Natural History Cabinet of Curiosities, which we now know as the Museum of Natural History, held all the university's geological specimens and was housed in that space until 1886, when the Natural Science Department moved out of the old capital. Next slide, please. Here we have the house chamber. It is a space where our current constitution, though amended many times over the years, was first written. Three state governors were inaugurated in this space and six general assemblies met here. You'll see that the room is primarily a scarlet red with the exception of the green curtains behind the speaker's house this was to denote his importance and draw attention to him. In 1972, during the renovations, removal of plaster walls revealed anchor holes for the original gallery, which was then reconstructed according to those holes and marks on the walls. A floor was elevated on columns and furnished with pews. You'll see that in the lower right-hand corner. This is where the women sat. The height and angle of the gallery make it impossible to see who is speaking on the house floor. This prevented the women from leaving the space and gossiping about the lawmakers. The benches, while quite uncomfortable today, were designed to accommodate hoop skirts. So they're seated at a different pitch and there's a large opening in the back for a bustle. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, uh, Many people viewing today may remember the fire. On the morning of November 20th, 2001, a fire broke out in the cupola of the old Capitol. Contractors used a heat gun, although, pro although prohibited in their contract, to strip decades of paint from the structures and the uh, columns surrounding the cupola. The blaze destroyed that cupola, the dome, and the bell but was contained by that firewall installed during the 20s restoration. The fire and tens of thousands of gallons of water used to extinguish it 
caused smoke and extensive water damage throughout the building. It's estimated that there were 50,000 gallons of water uh, pumped onto the building that day. Most of it entered the building. Fortunately, none of our items were damaged beyond repair. In large part, uh, we credit the firefighters who were present that day. Uh, they moved many of the artifacts into the center of each room and covered them with heavy duty tarps and plastics to keep them dry. Had they not done that, the, the damage would have been extensive. The losses would have also been um, extensive. The old Capitol would undergo four and a half years of repairs and renovations before reopening to the public with a ceremony in 2006. When it was reopened, the rooms were restored to uh, the, the state that we saw them in the previous pictures. Um, it was, uh, some paint colors were changed, but it was almost as if nothing had happened, which still ceases to amaze me. And finally, the next slide, please. In the late 1930s, acclaimed prairie style architect, Frank Lloyd visited the campus to give a lecture. At that time, he was quoted as saying, forget your sentimentality for the old capital, else you are doomed to destruction. Clearly, Mr. Wright was not a fan. I think he must have said that because he never had the opportunity to see the old capital under the spring sun with the lawn dotted with students. For if he had, he might feel as I do and agree with Professor Margaret Keyes when she said, in the years since the 1976 dedication and grand reopening of the old Capitol, the building has changed measurably and yet it seems unchanged in spirit. So if you are in Iowa City or you happen to visit Iowa City, we hope to be reopening soon and would love to welcome you to the building. With that, I'll turn it over to Joni to talk about our current capital. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, I'm sure that everyone is expecting me to begin today with Des Moines, but I'm going to actually begin our journey in Monroe City. Most Iowans don't know that we established a capital in Jasper County. Monroe City existed for only about two years. The legislature abandoned this site in 1849. In 1855, the legislature selected Des Moines as the capital city, and that 1855 bill stated that the capital was to be constructed within two miles of the fork of the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers, and it was to be built at no cost to the state. In 1857, we adopted our current constitution, and it established Des Moines as the permanent seat of government. In 1858, the legislature convened in Des Moines for the first time. On our next slide, you'll see the building that they used in 1858. The capital that we know today was not yet constructed. When the legislature began working here, they used this three-story brick building. It was built on land donated by Wilson Alexander Scott and Harrison Lyon and the building was paid for with private funds and a loan from the state school fund. After 10 years, this capital was so overcrowded that they decided to add a story. But because it was so poorly constructed, they could not add a story on top. So they jacked up the building and they added a fourth story underneath. That same year, 1868, a bill passed to build a new capital. A commission was formed to decide on a plan for a quote, fit, durable and fireproof structure to be built on Capitol Square. On this next slide, you will see a map of 1868 Des Moines. And within that yellow circle, you will see the approximate 10 acres that we began with here in Des Moines. On the right side of that circle is a section left undeveloped. That was Capitol Square. Next slide, please. 
A 10 member commission was formed to oversee the construction of the Capitol. Their first job was to choose stone for the foundation. The foundation was completed and the cornerstone was laid in 1871. But unfortunately, that original stone was filled with moisture and in the winter it froze and the stones crumbled. We replaced the commission and that commission replaced the foundation and we relayed the cornerstone in 1873. Next slide, please. The second Capitol Commission selected one of their members, Robert Finkbein, as the superintendent of construction. The Capitol was actually built by day labor for the most part. The Capitol Commission did sign a few contracts with a few small firms, usually they were local, but day laborers built our capital as we know it today. And Robert Finkbein would have been in charge of that day-to-day -day construction. On our next slide, you will see how work progressed. By the late 1870s, the legislature approved the redesign of the dome. The original plans by John Cochran and Alfred Picknard called for a dome that was much taller and smaller in diameter. Cochran had left the project before it began in 1871 and Picknard passed away in 1876. Architects Bell and Hackney were employed to finish the project. Bell proposed the dome be shorter and larger in diameter. And once the legislature signed off on the new dome, the work continued. On the next slide, we see that the Capitol is completed, at least from the exterior. With the dome finished, this allowed us to do the work on the inside. That was important because they needed to heat the building and they needed to keep the elements out. Keep in mind that the legislature, the governor, the Supreme Court justices are in that brick capital just across the street watching all of the construction take place. The legislature was very impatient to move into their new building. In January of 1884, the legislature convened once again in the brick capital, but after only three days, they climbed into carriages, they rode around the corner, they entered the new capital to continue the work of then the 20th General Assembly. Next slide, please. Inside the building, our 50 senators would have taken their places inside our beautiful Senate chamber. On the next slide, you will see the deaths of the 100 representatives as they took their place. And finally, this third slide, you will see the library as it was completed. These three rooms are on the second floor of the Capitol. And this is the area that was completed in 1884. So the legislatures were really, really happy to get to work in their new building. Remember that each one of these rooms is the approximate size of the entire brick capital. Next slide, please. By 1885, we were concentrating on the first floor of the capital. On the next slide, you will see the governor's office. That was the first area to move in. Uh, they dedicated this space in 1885 and Governor Sherman was the first governor to use this area. On the next slide, you will see the treasurer's office. The treasurer did not get to move into the Capitol building until October of that year. On the next slide, you will see the auditor's office and then followed, of course, by the Secretary of State. These rooms were dedicated in March of 1885. Next slide, please. It wasn't until 1886 that the judicial offices moved into the new capital. And once again, all three branches of government were using the same building. On this next slide, you're going to see the capital as it was finished in 1886. June 30th of that year, the capital commissioners delivered their final report to the governor. The final report showed that they had spent about $2,900,000 building our capital. This report also included a list of all the things that remained unfinished. In our next slide, we see the Capitol from the exterior. Between 1886 and 1902, work continued on the Capitol. 
This was actually under the supervision of the custodian. By now, the Capitol Commission no longer existed. We tried to finish the decorative painting in the rooms on the ground floor and the third floor. The south and west steps on the outside were completed. We continued landscaping on the outside of the building. And finally, by the turn of the century, the legislature formed a third capital commission to do a study. They wanted to know what they needed to do to finish the building. And they also needed to know about repairs. By this time, we'd been using the building for 25 years and there were needed repairs. A fourth capital commission was formed and they were in charge of overseeing this work. On the next slide, you're going to see the interior of the building once again, because I'd like to point out the areas that were really very obviously left unfinished. The public spaces of the Capitol did not even have a coat of paint. These walls were just plain white plaster. We had large frames that were installed in the building to hold great works of art but they had remained empty for nearly 25 years. During this time, the commission replaced 300 windows. They replaced the original slate roof with a copper roof. They put gold on the dome for the second time. They wired the building for electricity. And while the electricians were working inside air shafts, running those electrical lines, they were using candles to light their way the story is Mr. Frazier left a candle burning in committee room number five, and it started a fire. If you'll go to the next slide, please. We were very lucky. The Capitol did not burn down that cold January day. In fact, we were lucky. The only structural damage was the ceiling in the House of Representatives. The photograph on the right shows what the House chamber looked like the day after the fire. You can see all the rubble, the glass from the skylight, chandeliers charred on the chamber floor. The next slide will show you what the building looked like by the time that fourth Capitol Commission had finished their work. They were waiting for Frederick Dealman to finish his six mosaic panels. As you look at this photograph, that's going to be right in the center of your screen. And even though the commission was supposed to finish by 1906, Frederick Dielman did not finish his mosaics until 1907. When we added in the cost of the repairs because of the fire and the cost of doing all that updating around the building and all the repairs, we added about another $500,000 to the cost of the capital. So we're looking at a capital that cost us about $3.3 million. On this next slide, you're going to see just a beautiful picture of the Capitol. But keep in mind when you look at this picture that from the time that fourth Capitol Commission ended in 1906 until 1983, there were no major projects in or around the Capitol building, but there were countless small projects and they changed the building. The glass tile floor that was in the first floor center rotunda was removed. The decorative painting that had been done throughout the Capitol building in all 109 rooms was slowly painted over. The dome was regilded in 1927 and 1965. And when the original light colored blue sandstone began to decay, rather than repair it, we sprayed gunite over the stone and we sealed in the moisture. This prevented the stone from breathing. And in the early 1980s, chunks of sandstone began falling from the building. The legislature realized our capital had been neglected for too long and they appropriated funds. In 1983, exterior renovations began, as you'll see on this next slide. We replaced all the white decorative blue sandstone we replaced it with limestone on the exterior of the building. We installed more than 400 new windows. We put new copper on the roof. We put gold on the dome for the fifth time. The exterior renovations took about 20 years and we spent about $40 million. The next slide will show you the inside of the building. We started inside in 1997. Restoration painting had started full-time in 1976 and it continues today, but this did not include the needed renovations and necessary updates in our mechanical systems. 
From 1997 to 2011, we installed new electrical lines, phone lines, computer lines. We updated steam heat to hot water heat. This allowed us to install a universal cooling system using chilled water to cool the offices. We also needed to install a fire suppression system. Believe it or not, from 1904, the time of the fire till now, we did not really have a fire suppression system in our Capitol building. To accomplish this work, we had to remove flooring, we channeled up through walls, we cut huge holes into our beautiful ceilings to install sprinkler lines and all the wires. The photos on the right show the House of Representatives on the top and the Senate on the bottom. We spent more than $8 million on just those two rooms. We spent about $60 million total on the interior renovation. The next slide will show you the last major project that we took on, and that was to replace the glass tile floor in the center rotunda. On the next slide, you may remember that just a couple of years ago, we completed work on the main dome. Now you would have seen scaffolding on the outside of the building, but that just really allowed them access to the inside of the building. This was structural work. It really was not renovation to speak of. Uh, the brick was crumbling, again, because of moisture. We had to replace about 17,000 bricks in our main dome. That sounds like a lot, but we have 667,525 bricks in our dome. So 17,000 was just a small amount. This was the only time in all the work I've seen go, go on around the Capitol building, um, all the projects that we've done, that I've seen them finish ahead of schedule and under budget. Uh, we spent about $9 million working on the large dome. And now on the next slide, we're going to step back inside our capital, beautiful capital today. You know, it's amazing to me how much the Capitol building has changed from that 1970s when I first began working in the Capitol till today. Uh, this is standing on the glass floor. We're looking straight up into the dome. We're looking about 200 feet straight up into the main dome of the Capitol building. It really is kind of a monument to the, the men and women who created the building and maintain our seat of government. The next slide will take you into our old Supreme Court chamber. Now I say old Supreme Court because all of the judicial offices moved out of the Capitol building during these major renovations. And they did that in 2003. We built a new judicial building and all of the space that they occupied in the Capitol building is now used by the House of Representatives. The old Supreme Court is used as a committee room today. The next slide will show you the treasurer's private office. This is a great example of the restoration painting. You can imagine our restoration painters surprise as they scrape away white uh, paint and they find this design underneath. You can see that entire tapestry design covering the wall. On the next picture, we'll look at our Secretary of State's office today. Uh, restoration has taken place on the walls in the Secretary of State's office. The ceiling has yet to be done. And on the right side, you're going to see a picture of that 1857 Constitution. And I wish that I had a little different angle on this because if I did, you would see that it looks exactly like that Constitution picture that Liz showed you earlier in the Old Capitol. Again, this would have been pinned in Old Capitol in Iowa City. And this would have been the Constitution that established Des Moines as the state capital. It also established the University of Iowa in Iowa City. That's part of our constitution. The next slide, we'll look at the auditor's office. This is a great example of the reproduction light fixtures we have. You know, when we took out the gas lights in the Capitol building and put electric lights in, we found no need to save them. So we took all of our beautiful chandeliers and we threw them away. As we're doing the restoration work in the Capitol building, we have relied on St. Louis antique lighting to reproduce all of our gas fixtures. In the next picture, you're going to see our governor's office today. Our governor's office and actually all of our executive offices are just a great example of what our Capitol looked like early on. You can see in this room, all of the beautifully carved wood. It would be cherry in this area, one of 12 types of wood in the building. See all the beautiful designs on walls and ceilings. We have 29 different types of marble. 
In the next slide, you're going to see the governor's private office today. Again, you'll notice a fireplace, uh, not as noticeable in this picture as it was in some of the other executive offices pictures. But um, we have 24 fireplaces in the building. We never use them for heat. We've always had steam heat here in the Capitol building. And just a reminder when we look at these executive offices that these offices stay the same. You know, our elected officials come and go. Uh, but this is our Capitol building and it has been our seat of government for 135 years. Within our Capitol building in the next slide, you're going to see that we have displays. We have a model of the battleship Iowa. This is a favorite of groups when they come in. Around the corner on the next slide, you're going to see that we have dolls that represent all of our governor's spouses in their inaugural dress. Above that is a large photograph of World War I soldiers who served in the 168th Infantry. We're going to quickly go back upstairs now. Remember, this is the part of the building that we started using first in 1884. This is the library as you see it today. This is the most popular room in the building. It's beautifully restored. It's open to the public normally, not right now, but hopefully soon it will be open again. Today, the library houses primarily the legal portion of the library's collection. Uh, other portions of the collection are in buildings around the Capitol complex. So we move to the next slide and look in the Senate chamber. You're looking at the same desk that we looked at in that original photograph. Uh, senators have been using the same area and they have done a wonderful job of maintaining this space. We've seen very few changes in this room. You're looking at original gas chandeliers. They were converted to electricity when we wired the building. These are the only original chandeliers that we have in the Capitol. We have an original skylight here and an original ceiling. Uh, it has been touched up, it has been cleaned up, uh, but it is an original ceiling. It would have been completed in about 1883. The last slide will take us to the House of Representatives. And as you can guess, uh, we are not able to restore this area to that 1880s design, but rather the 1905 design. And that's because of the damages that were done by the fire. In the House of Representatives, you're looking at the same thing. You're looking at those desks that we saw in that original photograph back when we started our presentation here today. And I bet you're thinking to yourself, hmm, how do they have those original desks if that area caught on fire? Believe it or not, they carried the furnishings out. The building was on fire. They went in and they carried out desks. We saved them and were able to use them today. On this last slide, we're going to step back outside our Capitol building. And just a reminder that this remains our seat of government. Two of our three branches of government are still housed in this building. We are the only capital with five domes. We are one of 10 capitals with a golden dome. We welcome visitors to our Capitol building six days a week. And we really hope that you are one of those visitors very soon. I'm gonna hand it over to Matt now uh, and we'll take questions. Well, thank you, Liz and Joni. Uh, we, have, we have some time for some questions. However, before I pose the first question, I want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions through the Q&A feature here on Zoom. Now, we are on a schedule, so we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. Now, let's start with a good question, something I like. It's research. So a question for both of you, uh, and we'll actually start with Liz. Um, we have such great resources and information about your historic building. How did you and others go about researching your building, and do you have a favorite source? I do have a favorite source and thank you for asking. Much of my presentation is based on research and publications done by Professor Margaret Keyes. Professor Keyes was a professor of home economics at the University of Iowa when such a department still existed here. And she painstakingly researched every aspect about the old capital. It was really a labor of love for her and in fact, one of our exhibit gallery spaces is named for both Margaret Keyes and her father, Charles Keyes, who was an early archaeologist in the state of Iowa. Um, so the Keyes family plays a very important role in um, the knowledge that we have about the building, about its history, about its original purposes. Especially she's done extensive research into uh, what different 
departments of the university occupy different spaces and when. And uh, it's amazing to know how the building was repurposed and repartitioned. And um, I, I can't believe when I walk through it now, I, I can't even imagine because there's absolutely no evidence of that. So definitely the, the work by Margaret Keyes is one of the most authoritative and comprehensive. Of course, we're fortunate to have the University of Iowa Libraries and Archives and the Archives is a tremendous resource. That's um, one we use frequently. The photos that we have, many of them came from uh, F.W. Kent, who was a renowned Iowa City area photographer and is responsible for establishing really a, a treasure trove and great archive, not only of the university life from the uh, late 19, late early 1920s, let me start there, um, up until uh, probably the, the 60s and 70s, the period during which he was most active. So those resources really all come together to contribute to our tours, the presentation that you saw today, and um, the knowledge that we have about the building. So thank you for asking. Yeah, fantastic. Joni, so again, um, how do you go about researching for your building and any favorite source? My favorite source for research is our Capitol Commissioner's reports. Uh, it really is just basic knowledge about the Capitol building. Um, they don't really answer the question why uh, in those reports, but they tell me when, they tell me how much, uh, they tell me who did the work. Uh, it is just a great resource. The Capitol Commissioners would have been required to submit a biennial report for the entire time that they were building the building. And then of course that fourth Capitol Commission would have also submitted reports to the governor. Um, so that really is my basis for research. But in the time that I've been here, uh, we, we have found many different resources. Um, our pictures primarily are from two different collections. Uh, governor Larrabee, who was the first governor to occupy uh, the governor's office in this building for an entire term, uh, went around and asked that photographs be taken. Of course, that was 1886 and the building was brand new. And so we have those pictures. The, the originals of those pictures, by the way, sit on his desk up in Montauk. Uh, they still exist. And we also have photographs that were taken by Tom James. And he was a photograph here, a photographer, excuse me, here in the Des Moines area. And um, his photographs would have been taken uh, late 1880s, early 1890s. Uh, so that's my source for most of the original photographs that we have. We had a question about art. So I'm going to expand a little bit upon it, um, but I'll start with Joni actually. So uh, what busts are in the governor's office and then can the governor change the busts and pictures in the office? Uh, the answer to that is yes, the governor can. Uh, the governor has total control over what pictures are on the walls, what portraits are hanging in there, and also any other art that is sitting around. Um, most of that would be part of the collection that is housed uh, in your building, Matt and Jennifer, uh, in our archives. And uh, so we have a loan program. So uh, the people that work here in the Capitol building, elected officials can go uh, into the archives and they can choose what they want to put in their offices. It's just simply a loan, uh, it does not stay here. And they change them out frequently. Um, so the pictures uh, do change a lot. And the picture that I showed you today, uh, I can guarantee you that those pictures probably are not hanging in those spaces any longer. And to continue on with the art, uh, question for Liz, um, do you have a favorite piece of art in uh, the old Capitol? And then how do you choose which pieces go in the building? Because the building is a museum and on the National Register, um, the furnishings inside really don't change. There is only one piece of artwork and that is a reproduction of a portrait of George Washington. The only other things, items hanging on the walls would be uh, maps of the territory or state at the time. So that's a simple one. I, I will say uh, my favorite art is part of the architecture and that's the intricate carvings um, at the tops of each of the 
the columns that support the building. It's really beautiful. Um, an, another uh, piece that I like is just the, um, the composition of the library is very pleasing and the building itself is very serene. So I don't know if I can choose the building as a piece of art, but um, that may be my choice. We'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it works for me, yeah. And actually, you're, you're kind of stepping into the next question I'm gonna ask, and you touched a little bit about it. Uh, this is for both people, start with Liz, uh, but what is your favorite space in your building? You mentioned the library. So oh, mine is the library, yeah, yeah, hands down. Don't tell the other rooms though that I have a favorite. <laughs> Between us. And, and Joni, what's your favorite space in the Capitol? You know, I have to admit, Matt, that my favorite space changes all the time. <laughs> um, <it's, laughs> I, I try not to play favorites, but I would say to me, the most interesting part of the building, what I find to be the most fascinating is not in the public spaces. Uh, this would be the sub-basement of the Capitol where all the mechanicals are in the building and the attic of the Capitol. Uh, you really get a sense in those areas of how the building is constructed. Uh, you get a sense of the massive, massive building that we have. Uh, you know, the brick walls are, are 36 to 47 inches thick. Uh, the building is nothing but brick. But when you're looking in the finished spaces of the building, you don't ever see that. Um, you know, the cistern that we have in the sub-basement. Most people would not think about a cistern being part of the Capitol, uh, but I just love those spaces in the building. If you're going to make me choose a pretty room, I'm going to choose the Senate. Uh, the Senate is the closest to an original room that we have. There's just been so few changes, and uh, I just love the Senate chamber. Perfect. Now, once you learn about a site, a lot about a site, you have so many great facts to use. So my question to both of you, and we'll open to Liz first, um, but is there a fact or story about your building that you just wish people would know more about? Uh, well, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> but yes, I, I think probably um, the one that's maybe least understood uh, is the fact that there used to be a stable in the, the lower level or the, the ground floor of the old Capitol. And in the winter, that's where the legislators would uh, keep their horses out of the cold Iowa winters. Um, the other fun fact that I have is that uh, there used to be a two-story outhouse uh, that sat just behind the, the Capitol building. I don't really understand how that second story would operate. And I, I'm not really sure that I want to. But I think if there was a mystery that I'd like to explore a little bit or uh, be able to share more with, because people do ask us about it on occasion, um, it would be understanding more about how both the stable operated in the building and that mysterious outhouse. That's a great answer. I like that. And, um, and Joni, is there any story or fact about the, the capital that you want to see more people should know? Um, well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to follow Liz in the story about the stable. Now, what I would like to do in our Capitol building is to uh, to let everyone know that that is a fable here in our Capitol. And I think maybe people get the Capitals confused. Uh, we never had a stable here in the present day Capitol. Uh, the ground floor was not used uh, for horses to come in and out. Uh, we had a, a white marble tile floor. Uh, we had offices here on this level. And so we did not use it as a stable here in the present day Capitol. I think the other really amazing thing to me is how our building functioned prior to electricity. You know, we used the building for about 25 years and we had elevators here in the Capitol. So before electricity, we used water pressure to raise and lower them. And you know, we had telephones in the building. Of course, there would have been batteries that we used for that telephone system to work. Uh, we had a paging system in the House and Senate to call pages. Again, that would have been a system that would have used the batteries uh, before we had electricity. And the clocks, we had a, a master clock in the attic of the Capitol, it would spark and uh, it would control all the 17 clocks within the Capitol building. We changed that to a pneumatic system, by the way, 
uh, about 1913, 1915, somewhere around in there. And we got rid of that spark up in the attic. You can probably guess why. That probably wasn't the best idea in a building a little, that had already caught fire. I was a little worried. <laughs> you said that. Uh, our next question is for Liz. And uh, just, um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but how is the old capital being used now? Today, we're primarily a museum. Um, so we're available once we're allowed to reopen will be available to the public. Um, by the way, the, the building is uh, incredibly quiet and we miss our visitors very much. Um, we miss having university students in it and, and families who are here on campus tour. It, it's, um, it's really something else. It's a, a special maybe privilege to be in the building when things are so still and so quiet, but uh, I much prefer the hustle and bustle of, of people visiting. But the building is primarily used as a museum. Uh, we do have two gallery spaces, the Keys Gallery that houses cornerstones, a uh, series of panels that explain much about the founding of our state, the history of our state, and of course, the building of, of the old capital. We also have the Hansen Gallery on the lower level, the ground floor, that um, is home to uh, temporary or rotating exhibits. Um, we also sometimes in the second floor rotunda put exhibits. Right now, um, we have an exhibit, Hard One, Not Done, that looks at uh, the women's struggle for suffrage and how it continues today. And in that Hansen Gallery on the ground floor, we have a look back at 100 years of hydraulic research done here at the uh, Iowa Institute for Hydraulic Research. Those are both available virtually for folks who are wanting to visit. We'll soon have a virtual tour of the entire building available on our website. The other functions that happen in the building, I, I touched on a little bit in the Senate chamber, we do use that space for events, uh, often lectures, um, recitals. My favorite is piano Sundays when students from the School of Music at the university have the opportunity to play on rows that grand piano from 1850. Um, it's also really special when a wedding happens in the building. That's a really lovely thing. Um, so those are the primary uses. We have office space on the ground floor as well. Those are the primary uses. And this is a great kind of leeway to our last question. Before I ask the last question, I just want to say we have received a few great comments of saying thank you to both you guys for joining us today and doing this program. So I want to share that with us, uh, with you guys, before we get to our last question. Pretty simple to end with, but uh, Liz, why don't you tell us how people can learn more or visit your site? Uh, the easiest way right now to get information about um, either the Old Capitol Museum or I'll also put in a, a plug for the Museum of Natural History since we both form the Punicrest Museums is to visit our website. And would you would you like me to drop that web address in the chat for folks? Um, actually, it'll be included in our email that goes out tomorrow. Great. Okay. The address, the web address is simply Pentecrest Museums, all one word, dot uiowa, dot edu. And we hope to be uh, social media, our Facebook and Instagram pages, our Twitter account, also great ways to keep up with us. And we hope that um, we'll be reopening very soon um, and welcoming people back to both buildings. And Thank you and Jennifer uh, for having us today. This has been an absolute delight and to all the people from all around who were able to tune in and, and participate. I really appreciate their time as well. Yeah, of course. And then Joni, how can people learn more or visit the Capitol? Our Capitol building uh, is currently open. Uh, of course, the legislature is here working now and uh, you can visit the Capitol building from eight to five Monday through Friday and from eight until four on Saturdays. If you'd like to learn more about the Capitol building, our legislative website is a great place to, uh, to really get started. Uh, there is a tab there called Capitol Tours and Resources 
And under that, you'll find lots and lots of information that's available to you. And you can also call me directly. I'm here at the Capitol building every day from 8 to 4.30, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Perfect. And with that answer, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. And I think we all can agree this has been a very informative lunch, and it's been great having a little chat about this. Also, thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future programs in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look in some of our other fantastic visual programs, such as our Goldie's Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Now, thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again Thursday, April 8th for our next Iowa History 101 webinar. Thank you, everyone.